All right, so hi everyone. My name is Natalie. I'm the Association Manager of AHIA's Activities. Uh, welcome to the webinar, Adult Birth Adolescent Preferences for EQ 5DY Health States, hosted by the AHIA Health Preference Research Specialist Interest Group. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and will be recorded and uploaded to our website afterwards. A link will be sent via email. Before we begin the webinar, I just wanted to run through a couple housekeeping items. If you experience any technical issues during today's webinar, please write them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen and I'll be happy to assist. Everyone on the line has been muted for the presenter in an effort to eliminate background noise. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the chat box and they will be addressed by today's speaker. We will be circulating a survey following the webinar to obtain feedback, so we ask that everyone please take a couple minutes to fill it out. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to Fern, uh, today's moderator and uh, convener of IHEA's Health Preference Research Special Interest Group, who will introduce our speaker. Um, thank you all for joining. My name is Fern Terrace Prestel, and I'm uh, one of the co-conveners of the Special Interest Group in Health Preference Research. It's really exciting to have our very first webinar today, so um, um, we're, we're really happy to have you. Um, just a few words on what, what is the aim of our scope and uh, who, who we are. Um, so the, we, the Special Interest Group on health preference research really aims to be a forum for discussion, both applied and methodological discussion on health preferences, whether it be, uh, and probably most of the people involved in this uh, special interest group will have, uh, it'll be related to discrete choice experiments, um, how to de design them, uh, do the experimental design, as well as the analysis, but also discussions um, applied discussions and if you have presentations that you'd like to give and get feedback on we would very much welcome you so we, we welcome also work in progress so that you can get some feedback thinking about where to publish and how to publish it and how to frame your studies so it doesn't all have to be perfectly polished work um, we welcome that as well um, so without further ado um, we'd like to welcome Kuno who is Kuno Shah who has kindly um, Ex volunteered or accepted the request to publish his work. Um, Kuno Shaw is a health economist and is associate director in, um, at the Office of Health Economics. And he's done quite a lot of health preference research. So we're very happy to have him here um, today. Um, and he's going to present on adolescence versus adult preferences for the EQ 5D why health status. So we look very much forward to um, hearing your presentation, Kuno. Over to you. Thank you, Fern, and thanks to IHEA and to the Health Preference Research Special Interest Group for inviting me. I'm going to begin with some brief acknowledgements. Uh, this presentation is going to present selected findings from research that was funded by the Eurocall Research Foundation. Uh, and this research was done in collaboration with colleagues from the University of Oxford, University of Melbourne, Accentiva, and the University of Bielefeld. There's going to be three main components to my talk. I'm going to begin by introducing the measurement and evaluation of health in children. I'm then going to discuss some of the challenges around evaluation research in this area. And then for the main part of my presentation, I'm going to present some findings from work that we've done on valuing the EQ5DY. So patient reported outcome measures have traditionally been developed and applied in adult populations, but increasingly researchers in health economics, health technology assessment and related disciplines are recognizing the importance of measuring and valuing the health of children and adolescents. There are a number of different patient reported outcome measures for this purpose. For example, the Pediatric Quality of Life Inventory, the Kids Screen. Um, some of these instruments have simple summative scoring algorithms. They assume that all dimensions are of equal importance and that any intervals between the response levels are equal. 
and for various reasons, <clears throat> they're not amenable to valuation. So for some of these measures, the, the sheer size of the descriptive system and the content of the dimensions precludes valuation. And importantly, uh, in the context of health economics, it means that they're not suitable for the estimation of policy adjusted life years, which precludes their use to inform things like cost effectiveness analysis and economic evaluation. There are some preference based measures that have been developed in this area. So, for example, the, uh, the Huey Mark II, the CHU 9D, and also um, the younger population or youth version of the Eurocall Group's EQ5D instrument, the EQ5DY. And that's going to be the instruments that I'm going to be focusing on for some of this presentation, although a lot of the concepts I'm going to be discussing are relevant to all generic preference based measures. In case you're not familiar with the EQ5DY, this is what it looks like. Um, it's the same broad five dimensions as the adult EQ5D, but with a few changes, um, mainly in the sort of labels for various levels. So whereas for the three level version of EQ, the adult version of EQ5D, the level three in mobility refers to um, I am confined to bed. For the child version, it's I have a lot of problems walking about. You can also see that for usual activities, the, the, the ex, uh, examples given for different activities are more child friendly, things like going to school, hobbies, playing. And instead of referring to anxiety or depression, in the Y version, the label refers to being worried, sad, or unhappy. So the EQ5DY was developed in 2010 and it's designed for use in children and adolescents aged eight to 15. Um, and I've included in this slide an extract from the EQ5D user guide, which gives a bit more information about the different age ranges and the suitability of the EQ5DY in different circumstances. So I, if you're interested, I recommend looking at the user guide for more information. So there is a distinction between how you describe health or measure health and how you value health. Um, and thinking about the quality adjusted life year, it's worth noting that the quality adjustment in the quality requires two pieces of information. The first is the description of the patient's health. So this can be done using proxy or self-reported um, EQ5D health states. The patient or a proxy is given the EQ5DY questionnaire and they're asked to complete it. And then the second stage is the valuation. And ideally these, for, for, for using qualies, should result in utilities or values that are on a scale that's anchored at zero, where zero is equal to dead, and one, where one is equivalent to full health. So how do we get these values? Well, typically, we ask members of the general public to complete a series of stated preference exercises. And conventionally, these exercises are choice-based, normally preferred by economists because they have to involve some sense of opportunity cost and sacrifice. The central to all of the different stated preference exercises is the idea that survey respondents consider a range of different health states and imagine what it would be like to experience them and to use the stated preference tasks to give an indication of how good or bad they think the health states are in relation to each other or in relation to some anchor such as dead. For decision making, we need a set of values that represents the overall view of whatever sample or population we're trying to measure the health of um, or measure the preferences of. And there are a number of different preference elicitation techniques which can be used to obtain health state values. Uh, the rating scale being one of them, although those typically aren't choice-based methods. Then there's also the standard gamble, the time trade-off, and also the discrete choice experiment, which Fern referred to earlier. So where are we with the EQ5DY? Well, its use is growing. Uh, it's available for use in many different countries with over 40 different language versions. And increasingly, there is use demand for its use in health technology assessment. But the problem is while we can measure the health of children using the EQ5DY, there currently exist no value sets to support their use in health technology assessment. Um, and there has been research 
that's shown that you can't just get around this problem by applying an adult EQ5D3L value set to EQ5DY. Even though the structure of the two instruments is similar, they both contain the same five dimensions, they both contain three severity levels, but there was a multi-country valuation study that was led by Simona Kreimeyer and colleagues, recently published in Value and Health, that showed that health states are valued rather differently when they're described as applying to a child rather than for an adult. And that there seems to be a complex for interaction between study perspective and the wording of the descriptive system. So what that means is that in order to obtain EQ5DY values, you really need to do dedicated research to obtain those um, health state valuations. There are a number of challenges involved in valuation in this area. Some of these involve normative issues, like questions about whose preferences we should be eliciting. When you are um, wanting to value the health of children, should you be eliciting the preferences of children or should you be eliciting the preferences of adults who are responsible for children or thinking about children? And there's perspective issues. So if you ask adults to express their preferences, whose health should they be thinking about when they're expressing those preferences? Should it be their own health or should it be the health of children? And if the health of children, what kind of child should they be thinking about? And then there's methods issues. How do we elicit the preferences and how do we decide on this choice? We've seen from previous empirical research that visual analog scale and time trade-off have been used in past research. And there's been some evidence to suggest that visual analog scale values are lower for the EQ5DY than they are for the EQ5D adult version, but also conflicting evidence suggesting that in fact, time trade-off values are higher for the EQ5DY. And one of the hypotheses behind this latter result is about the time trade-off as a method. The time trade-off, central to what the time trade-off involves, is this sense of sacrificing life years. The goodness or badness of a, of a given health state is determined by how willing you are to sacrifice time in full health in order to avoid that health state. And it may be that when thinking about children as distinct from adults, people are really reluctant to sacrifice life years for children. They, they see that as something abhorrent, something they're really averse to doing. And it's as a result of that viewpoint that the time trade-off values are higher uh, for time trade-off than they are for other methods. In which case, the results we see might simply be an artifact of the methods. Um, so whose preferences should be used? Well, the position adopted by decision makers in a number of different countries about health state valuation and the valuation of patient reported outcome measures is that the relevant preferences are those of the general public as distinct from um, groups like patients or specific subgroups for whom the healthcare is intended for. And this is reflected in the Eurocor groups protocol for valuing EQ5DY and EQ5D um, there, the Eurocore group's view is that EQ5D value sets should be based on the preferences of the general public, not of the particular subgroup whose health is being valued. There's a number of different arguments for this. Um, this reflects the fact that health technology assessment is intended to inform allocation decisions across an entire population or health system and not just to make a decision about a single technology and about a single um, patient group. Another argument is that members of the public are taxpayers and they're also potential users of healthcare. Um, when we're making health resource decisions, we're not just interested in those who are patients now, but we're also interested in anyone who might become a patient in the future and any member of the public may be a potential user of healthcare and a future patient. And also, there's also the insurance principle, say, whereby the preferences used to determine coverage patterns under health insurance plans should be those of the beneficiaries, and these should be determined empirically prior to the need for any specific treatments rather than ex post. 
there's also adaptation exam, um, arguments. So patients may adapt to some aspects of their conditions, and there are some aspects of adaptation that don't seem appropriate to take into account when making resource allocation decisions. Um, for example, if um, the adaptation is caused by lowered expectations about what it constitutes, um, what constitutes good health. There's a number of different arguments for using public preferences over, say, patient preferences. So if we accept that, then the next question is, well, who counts as a member of the public? And in the UK, where I'm based, um, we find that uh, decision makers and policy makers aren't particularly prescriptive about what it means to be a member of the public. And there seems to be an implicit consensus that a member of pub the public is someone who bears the cost of providing healthcare and someone who's eligible to vote. And both of those criteria would appear to exclude children and adolescents from having their preferences counted. On the other hand, you could argue that it is relevant to obtain the preferences of children and adolescents because they are potential patients and users of health care for children. Um, if the argument being used for public preferences is that members of the public could be potential patients in the future, that doesn't really apply in the context of health interventions, health technologies for children, because an adult could never be a potential user of healthcare for children, whereas children could be. There's also arguments um, made by the likes of Matthias Verstech and Werner Brauer um, saying that it's relevant to at least understand the preferences of children, um, at, at the very least for use in non-health technology assessment uses of the instrument. Um, or as a complement to public preferences. And further, part of the um, reluctance to elicit the preferences of children in the past has been that conventional techniques like standard gamble and time trade-off involve quite difficult cognitive skills, involve thinking about probabilities, risks, indifference points, time preferences. And there are also ethical issues involved with asking young people to conduct elicitation tasks involving notions such as serious ill health and death. But there are alternatives to these techniques that are available that may be more suitable for listing the preferences of younger people. And we, we would argue that discrete choice experiment is one such method. It's also interesting to take a look at what HTA agencies say about this. Um, and I've taken an abstract here from NICE's patient and public involvement policy. And we see that NICE is committed to involving children and young people on matters pertinent to NICE's work and what matters that affect children and young people's health. NICE is also committed to ensuring that the perspective of children and young people are taken into account in relevant areas of NICE's work, and that NICE's guidance should be informed and influenced by their views. So all of this seems to suggest that NICE, at least in principle, would be interested in understanding the preferences of children and adolescents. So the other challenging question was whose health um, should, be, should, should we be thinking about? If we are to use adult preferences, as has traditionally been done to value child health instruments, whose health should they be thinking about? Should they be valuing their own health? Should they be ha valuing their own health, but imagining that they are a child, so trying to adopt a child health perspective? Should they be thinking about the health of their own child, in which case can only parents or grandparents be involved in such research? Should they be thinking about an unidentified child, which would open it up to all kinds of adults? But if that's the case, then, well, what information should we give about this unidentified child? How old should the child be, given the fact that instruments like the EQ5DY cover a range of ages? The EQ5DY typically used uh, for children and adolescents aged between 8 and 15. How old should the child be um, that's presented in a health valuation exercise? This table shows um, some of the approaches that have been used to date for different instruments and in different countries. We see that in the majority of the cases, 
the samples used have been adults. There are a few examples of adolescents um, being, being surveyed. And where there have been adults being surveyed, in the majority of cases, they're being asked to take an own health perspective rather than think about the health of children. And a, a variety of different elicitation methods have been used, rating scale, standard gamble, time trade-off, and then a couple of examples of discrete choice experiment being used in more recent studies. So I'm gonna now talk about some recent research that my colleagues and I have been doing on the EQ5DY. The first study was what we call a latent scale DCE study. Here we conducted a discrete choice experiment in order to obtain preferences for EQ5DY health states using a sample of adults. The values obtained are a latent scale. So by that, I mean that they are on an undefined scale and the values tell us something about the relative importance of the dimensions, but they're not in themselves amenable to the estimation of qualies because they're not anchored on a scale where one is full health and zero is dead. The second study replicates the first one, but it, instead of using a sample of adults, it uses a sample of adolescents. And in this third study, which I'm only going to very briefly touch on uh, in this presentation, um, we test a range of methods for using the results of the first two studies and anchoring those onto the zero one quality scale. So study one, this was an online survey. Um, remember adult members of the public who belong to an online panel and we use quotas to ensure that the sample was representative in terms of gender, age and social grade, which is um, a sort of proxy for socioeconomic status. The adult respondents were given tasks that looked like the one shown on the screen. Two EQ5DY health states, they were asked to choose which they prefer, A or B, but importantly, they were, set, they were told to consider their views about a 10-year-old child. And we chose 10 years partly to be consistent with previous research that had been done, by, uh, been done elsewhere, but also because 10 years was somewhere roughly in the middle of the age range for the EQ5DY. It wasn't at either of the extreme ages. We sought the preferences of 1,000 adults in total. Um, we used a Bayesian efficient design in order to identify 150 health states to present. This was blocked into 10 different groups. Um, so each respondent received 15 DCE choice tasks. And we also added one fixed pair that was the same for all respondents. And we used this as a sort of rationality check or dominance test. So one health state clearly dominated the other. We included this partly for data quality checking reasons um, whenever researchers do online DCE studies, there are often um, concerns raised about the quality of the data ensured. So we wanted to include this to do a check on um, the quality of the data and also for potentially for use in sensitivity analysis. So for example, running the models whilst excluding people who fail the dominance test. The survey included the following elements. Uh, there was a screening process to make sure that um, they met the representative quotas uh, that we needed for our sample. Respondents then self-reported their own health using EQ5DY. They then received 16 choice tasks, 15, pair, 15 DCE pairs, and then the one fixed pair. There were some debriefing questions, and finally, some further background questions. And the data were collected in 2017. In terms of the analysis, we used a series of logit models to analyze the data. Um, we tested the use of multinomial logit model, scaled multinomial, multinomial logit, mixed logit, and generalized multinomial logit. Um, and we evaluated the model performance in terms of goodness of fit and prediction accuracy. And we also um, 
calculated the relative importance of the dimension. So we estimated the latent utility range for each attribute, divided that by the overall latent utility range for all attributes. And we used the model coefficients to generate an implied ranking for each attribute level. The second study, which involved using adolescence, involved pretty much exactly the same design as study one. The same, the same, the same block, block design, the same presentation, the same survey system. We sought a similar number of younger people in our sample. These were adults, and sorry, adolescents, aged between 11 and 17. And here they completed the survey, not from the perspective of a 10 year old child, but from their own health perspective. And the data were collected last year. So this is what the adolescent question looked like. Very similar to the adult question, but here the question that they were being asked was rather than from the perspective of a 10 year old child, which do you prefer? It was simply, which do you prefer, A or B? Here are some of the background characteristics. Um, we ensured through the use of quotas that the samples were representative of the UK general population in terms of gender in terms of age range, um, age group specific to, to the adults and adolescent samples, um, and also the nation from within the UK in which they came. Um, as you might expect, the adolescent sample was healthier on average than the adult sample with a much greater proportion reporting to be in full health as far as EQ5DY is concerned. No problems on any of the five EQ5DY health states. This slide shows the mixed logit results um, and the mixed logit was found to be our sort of best performing model in terms of the, the various criteria I described earlier. Um, it's a bit sort of difficult to interpret it from these numbers alone so I'm just going to move to the next slide and I'll just say that in both samples, the coefficient for each and every dimension level was negative and statistically significant at the 1% level, which is reassuring. Um, and we found using um, a test known as the sweet Louvier test that any differences in coefficients were not explained solely by differences in the scale. So this was evidence that there do exist pre differences in preferences between the two samples. According to our calculations of relative attribute importance, we see some differences between adolescents and adults. Um, pain and discomfort and anxiety and depression were clearly the most important dimensions for both samples. But then when it comes to the third most important dimension, we found that adults considered usual activities to be relatively more important, whereas adolescents considered mobility to be relatively more important. And that's, this is demonstrated in this next table. Um, we can see some similarities and some differences between the sample, and I've highlighted some of the differences here. So the adults and the adolescents seem to feel differently about the most extreme levels of mobility and about usual activities. And then there was also a bit of a reversal in the way they felt about sort of, um, moderate pain discomfort, moderate anxiety, depression, and being unable to wash or dress, dress yourself. We were always very mindful about respondent engagement. Um, it's always a consideration in online DCE studies. And I think we were even more mindful of it because we were seeking the preferences of young people who may not you know, be used to answering surveys of any, any nature uh, and there's sort of limited evidence to show whether or not they're capable of answering these kinds of questions. So you may recall a few slides earlier, I referred to the inclusion of a dominance test. Um, this was a pair in which one health state logically dominated the other one. One, 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 two, two is better in all respects than two, 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 three, three. So we would expect that any respondent who is taking the survey seriously should choose and should prefer 11122, with of course the 
acknowledgement that there's, there's going to be some inevitable error. Um, in all DCE surveys that I've done to date, there's always you know, a, a proportion of people who, who would fail this kind of test. And we saw in the adult version that around 90% of respondents chose the milder health state as we would expect. Um, reassuringly, we found a very similar proportion of adolescents also passing the dominance test. Another rather crude test of respondent engagement that we might apply, or in terms of face validity at least, is what we refer to as differences in level sum score. So level sum score is a sort of Europol jargon for the sum of the five dimension levels. It's a very crude um, proxy for the severity of a given health state. So the most severe health state in the EQ5DY is 33333. The level sum score for that health state is 15. That's 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3. Uh, on the other hand, 11111 would have a level sum score of 5. On average, we would expect health states with a lower level sum score to be preferred over health states with a higher level sum score. You know, it's not, it's not perfect. And if that was the only thing that mattered, we wouldn't need to bother with health valuation exercises. But it's a rough indication that we, we would expect to see borne out in the data. So we plotted these graphs that showed the proportion of respondents choosing either A or B according to the difference in the level sum score. And we would expect that where A had a much lower lum, level sum score than B, more people would choose A and vice versa. And that's exactly what we see in the data. We see both for adults and for adolescents that people that respondents tended to choose the health state with a lower level sum score. And that's really reassuring for us. It indicates that the data are of similarly good quality across the two samples. Another indication of respondent engagement is to look at dropout and completion. We saw that for adults, um, there were some people who dropped out at the consent stage, some people who started but didn't complete um, didn't complete the survey in full and then we also found that a small proportion completed the survey too quickly we identified based on piloting work that you needed a certain amount of time to be able to read the health states and take the survey seriously and we agreed with the panel provider to exclude those a priori um, and it was after those exclusions and dropouts were done we ha we had 1000 response set for analysis the Comparable statistics for the adolescents look like this. And we see that there were more people dropping out due to completing the survey too quickly, but not, not a worrying proportion. Um, and there, there weren't many who started but didn't complete a, a, um, provide a complete set of data. Um, the main area in which people failed to complete was in the screening stage because it, and I, and I maybe should have mentioned this a bit earlier, the adolescents that we sought for this sample were the children of adult members of the very same panel that we used for the adult survey. So they weren't children of the adult respondents. We made sure those adults were not contacted again, um, but they were the children of panel adult panel members. Um, and what that meant was that if by mistake, an adult clicked the click onto the survey, thinking that the survey was for them. It was then made very clear that this survey was intended for adolescents, and we said the age. And there may have been some adults who then dropped out at this stage when they realised that they weren't eligible to take part in the survey. I'll say a little bit about the debriefing questions. We included questions uh, using Likert type items, um, asking whether the respondents found the task difficult. And we see that reasonably similar proportions of adolescents and adults reported finding the task difficult. We were also asked the respondents whether they found it difficult to imagine the health problems described. And here we do see a slight difference. Um, we see that 
adolescents were more likely to agree that they found it difficult to imagine the health problems described than adults. And perhaps this is not surprising. Um, we already saw that the adolescents were on average healthier than the adults, and they're probably less likely to have experienced poor health in the past. And the less you've experienced health problems on these various dimensions, the more difficult it probably is to imagine living in those hypothetical health problems. I should mention some limitations. Um, we didn't specify what child the adults should be thinking about. Um, so we didn't provide information about whether, for example, um, the 10 year old child should be the adult's child or the adult thinking about themselves as a child. And it's perfectly possible that the results might have differed depending on the reference child that we specified. There's research underway by Richard Norman of Curtin University in Australia looking at this issue. They're doing um, a similar approach to what we've done in this study, a, D a, DCE, um, a DCE survey, but in a multi-arm study with different framings and different descriptions of what kind of child the respondents should be thinking about. So it'd be really interesting to see the results of that research. Um, it's also worth noting that there were differences in perspective. The adults were thinking about the health of others. They were thinking about a 10 year old child, whereas the adolescents were thinking about their own health. Um, so it's not just the sample that differed, but also the nature of the question that we were asking them to do. So a cleaner comparison might have been to ask adults to consider the health of another adult and then to consider the health of a child. Um, and that might, have, that, that, that might have resolved this limitation. Um, it's also worth noting that we weren't able to do a really clean like-for-like -like comparison in terms of age because the ad adults were being asked to think about 10-year-olds. There weren't actually any 10-year-olds in, in our adolescent sample uh, that comprised 11 to 17-year-olds simply because of a judgment that 10-year-olds would not be um, sort of old or developed enough to sort of understand these kinds of exercises. So it's perfectly possible um, that you could, you could extend this kind of research to 10 year olds or else repeat the work that we did for adults. But instead of asking them about a 10 year old child, you could ask them about say a 12 year old child. That would be an interesting route for further research. And I guess probably the single biggest limitation is we didn't include any information or attribute related to duration or dead and therefore our results were produced on a latent scale. Um, as a result we've got EQ5DY value sets they were, they were basically shown on the mixed logit model results that I showed on a previous slide um, but these are on an undefined scale and if we want to use this information in quality calculations, we need some way, some information to rescale those values so that one, 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 one is equivalent to one and dead at zero fits somewhere in this ranking of health states. Um, the, the different ways in which you might be able to, um, in which you might be able to anchor latent scale values. Um, some of the criteria might include feasibility. Um, how, how, you know, how, how feasible it is. Is it to apply different methods? Are some methods easier for respondents to understand than others? Um, in, in the anchoring study, that we did alongside this latent scale DCE work, we found that a range of different methods um, are potentially feasible, although all come with their different pros and cons and challenges. Another criterion might be acceptability to decision makers. So you might, for example, think that a visual analog scale would be the, the most feasible way of anchoring DCE data. Um, it's quite easy, it's straightforward to do that. You could even apply that online. Um, you just ask people to, um, to rate 
3333 and to rape dead. Um, but that might not be acceptable to decision makers who may have some prior beliefs about the desirable theoretical properties of what a method should be. And if they um, require that the method is choice based, that might preclude something like the visual analog scale. Another criterion might be the potential for administration online. One of the good things about ECE is that it's really easy to do online and you can obtain a really large sample relatively cheaply. Um, so there may be benefit in also having an anchoring method that's suitable for administration online as well. Then there's the question of whether there needs to be coherence between the preference data being anchored. Um, so for example, it may be that using VAS, the vision analog scale, to anchor latent scale DCE data is problematic because the preferences are listed using completely different sorts of tasks and with different biases affecting each one. Um, it may be that something like the time trade-off is more appropriate and they could, they, there, are more, um, there are more grounds for combining time trade-off and discrete choice experiment data. And then, I think probably the most important issue is consistency with adult valuations for use in health technology assessment. I think this is fundamental. Should the values for the EQ5DY and any qualies estimated from them be commensurate with those from adult EQ5D instruments? In other words, should a quali estimated for a child be equal to a quali estimated for an adult? Um, and this comes down to sort of practical issues about budgets. Um, if budgets for child health are not ring fenced, then in order to achieve allocative efficiency, we'd be relying on being able to consider qualities gained and foregone across both adult and child interventions. I think it's fair to say that in many health systems, you've got the same overall pot of money for both adult interventions and child interventions. So it doesn't really make sense to have these sort of rather different value sets with completely different characteristics when you're choosing to make decisions affecting both kinds of populations. And even where budgets for child healthcare is ring fenced, it's important to note that interventions that avoid the premature death of children can often involve quality gains both in adulthood and in childhood. So in practice, the complete clean separation of utilities and quality estimates is difficult, if not impossible. So I'm going to conclude my presentation here and finish with the point that um, we as health economists and as health preference researchers um, need to consider some of, some of these normative and practical issues. Um, it'd be useful for us to engage with stakeholders like HDA agencies in it and agree on a suitable way forward. I think it's a really promising and exciting area. Um, but there are plenty of unanswered questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic, Kunal. That was really, really interesting um, and opens a whole new world for me as I only work on DCE for design or for use in cost effectiveness. So this is really, really enlightening um, from my perspective. Um, we'd like to open it up for questions. So Milo or Naz, if you'd like to either because we're a small group we can actually um you know you can unmute yourself and naz if you'd like you could put any questions in the message box and we can uh read them out i have lots of questions but i'd like to open it up to you all first Mila, do you have any questions Okay, so without, in, in, in the meantime, um, I have a few design type questions, okay. um, which I thought might be some, I'd like your feed, your ideas on. So in, in terms of thinking about anchoring in dead, would you be able to have an opt out alternative, right, where you have state one, state two, or dead? So that would be one way to bring dead 
into the skill. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you've thought about that already. Yeah, we, we, we have. Um, shall, I, shall I pick up at that point? Um, yep. That, so the, the way you might do that is, yeah, by, by introducing dead or a duration element to the discrete choice experiment. Um, and this is something we actually did in the third study, the anchoring study, which um, wasn't the main focus of our presentation, but we, um, we introduced a duration element. So we attached duration to both of the different health states. So we said you'd be in this health state for six years and the other health state you'd be in for four years. And then they were asked to, to choose. Oh, um, good. What? Um, and there's been a fair bit of work, um, quite a bit led by researchers in Australia um, and the Netherlands on, on DC with duration. Uh, mm. There are sort of, you know, there's a bit of work to get the design right and to make sure that duration doesn't become the dominating attribute. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it, it, it is feasible. And the other way that you can introduce that element is, as you said, have dead as a third, um, a third alternative. So you're getting some information both on whether you think A is better than B or B is better than A, but also whether you think they are better than both are better or worse than being dead. Uh, that's another way of doing it. And I think um, colleagues in Australia refer to this as the triplets approach um, to DC with duration. So, so th th these approaches are plausible um, I'd be very wary of using them with a sample of adolescents. We were quite wary of um, introducing any concepts relating to dead and yeah. death um, when doing this with a younger sample, not least because it'd be so difficult to even get ethical approval for it. Uh, yeah. And just we weren't sure how meaningful the answers would be. But for adults, yeah, it's, 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 it is being done. Um, the Eurocall group is funding research on DCU with duration. Um, I think it's a promising way forward. And I suspect in the US you'd also have more trouble getting ethical approval versus Europe. I imagine so, but I, I'm, I'm certainly aware of DCE with duration work that's been done. Yeah, with duration, it makes a lot of sense. And the other um, thought was when you're th thinking about adults and adolescents, you could almost have a labeled experiment where you have one alternative is an adolescent and one is an adult just like your Pepsi, Cola, and Coca-Cola. And then in your label, you get evaluation. In your, in your constant for your label, you could potentially get a conversion factor, or um, you could use, yeah. So that it would be a way that you could actually get those values at the same time within yeah, the same. That's, Have you done that? that? that that's an, well, it's an interesting idea. Um, I'd need to give some thought about what that factor would mean in terms of interpreting it would it be a factor by which you could weight the adult values in order to obtain the child values or would it be telling you something about the respondents views about whether adults or adolescents should be prioritized um, it may be that people hold the view that you should always treat children above treating adults and they will always choose the label that the, the the child labeled alternative and maybe that's saying something quite different from the interpretation of what the health state is about and how it applies to an adult and how it applies to a child um so i, I, I definitely think it's worth exploring um maybe with some qualitative work mm -hmm. to see what people are thinking about when they're presented with that kind of question mm -hmm. there should be a, a trade-off point at some point right? One year life extension for a child versus a hundred years for an adult. At some point there will be a turning point, but uh, I absolutely agree. There might be much uh, more there. Yeah, there is. I mean, al although what we, what we've found when we've done the time trade-off work, asking adults to consider the health of adolescents, uh, there are some people who are just completely averse to this idea of trading time for children. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they're, they're just, they, they just find the idea abhorrent, you know, just a, a minority, but it may yeah. be, pro you know, it may end up being problematic uh, in the concept of trying to do a study that. Yeah. Look at so that. you could, you could explore with or without the duration attribute then, but it's, it's really, really interesting. Um, Milo or Naz, do you have any questions you'd like to add here?
Okay, I won't put you on the spotlight anymore. Just raise your hand if you'd like to. No, that's really exciting because um, we in in stated preference studies there are really two camps or or two streams of uses of discrete choice experiments. And one is around valuation of outcomes, which you've done, Kunal, it's really great to have you presenting here. And then the other stream is really around design um, and, and um, of, of goods and services, which is more the side that I work on. So I think it's a really nice introduction to, to our um, special interest group. Um, so Naz has made a comment, very nice study. What was your rationale for asking adults to make, to take a 10 year old child and the use being 11 to 17? Yeah, I mean, p part of this was that we did the adult, we did the adult study first and it was only after we completed the adult project that we thought, oh, wouldn't it be great to extend this to adolescence? I think if we'd known from the very start that we were gonna be doing both um, you say in parallel with each other, we would have taken a different approach. So we, we opted for 10 year old child because that's the, um, that's the, um, the time frame or the, the age reference that was used in previous work. So we wanted the work to be comparable to what other researchers had done. And also because, yeah, we, we felt that 10 years was sort of nice, nice round number for people to think about. Um, if I were to do the study again, I might choose to do so a 13 year old because that's somewhere in the middle of 11 and 17. Um, and I'd be very interested in sort of further work that looks at different age groups. Um, I suspect it wouldn't make a huge amount of difference. I, don't, I wouldn't have thought that people would feel that differently about a 10 year old compared to a 13 year old, but it's a, it's a question to be examined empirically. Well, I think in the UK, there's certainly a very negative sense of teenage boys, right? So there may actually, you may actually find that it comes out, right? There's a lot of... Yeah, okay. So not just a 10-year-old child, but a 13-year-old boy. And we can... See might that. have a double, double uh, challenge. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's just what I'm thinking about newspaper articles. Okay, that's... Fantastic. So there's also someone in Sheffield who I recently saw present in Warwick who's doing preferences of children. Um, not using a DCE, but she was trying to use some cards to measure trade-offs. And if you'd like, I can look up her name and I'll send okay. it to you. Yeah, that would be, that, that'd be very interesting. I mean, I know there's been some really good work by, um, by people at Sheffield on this. Mm. Um, people like Donna Rowan uh, and Catherine Stevens. Um, and a lot of that have been around the valuation of the CHU 9D, which is an instrument which I, I believe was actually developed, developed at Sheffield. Um, so that's great. And we, we are learning a lot um, from each other. Great. And so where are you planning to publish it? Uh, unknown yet in terms of target journal. We've got two separate papers. We've got a paper for the adult version. And there we go into a lot of detail about the, the modeling approaches and uh, a comparison of different uh, the different models we used. Um, Oliver Rivero Arias of the University of Oxford is the lead author of that paper. And then the second paper is specifically around the comparison between adults and adolescents, which I've focused on in this presentation. We're hoping to get both out as OHE research papers um, the next month or so. Um, they, they need to go through a light touch peer review process by a member of our editorial panel but when they're up, they'll be available for free download from ohe.org and then we'll be in the position to submit to a journal. So, and the main purpose of our work out there doing this kind of presentation, um, re releasing research papers is to, is to get feedback. So we'd be very happy to, to hear if people have got any suggestions for improving it. Let us know if you've done something wrong. Um, it'd be great to hear from you all. Yeah, that's fantastic. And are you going to be presenting this work at IHEA? Uh, it's not work I'm going to be presenting at I hear. The work I'm presenting at I hear is more based on stuff around my, um, my PhD research and um, preferences around end of life. But there are some similarities, but it's not really related to health state valuation. Um, okay. I've seen another question as well pop up about... Yes, you're absolutely right. Parent, adult, parent, child pairs and comparing. That's a fascinating idea. Um, and I think that's exactly what we would 
have done if from the very onset we had known we were going to do this adult and adolescent um, studies alongside each other because we did have the capability within the panel to do that because we were approaching um, adult panel members, many of whom also have children, so you could get them to do the studies uh, separately from each other, independent of each other, or even alongside each other, you know, that all of that would be very interesting to do. Mm -hmm. uh, as it turns out, we had one sample of adults and a completely separate sample of adolescents. Um, but it would be so interesting to see if adults felt differently from adolescents who were also their offspring. Um, not least because it would call into question whether adults are the appropriate people to be making decisions on behalf of children. Um, uh, and it brings up all sorts of sort of normative and ethical dilemmas. Um, but, you know, so that sort of thing is really interesting to me. Yes, absolutely interesting. We've always wanted to do it between uh, partners, male and female partners on HIV preferences, mm. HIV uh, um, prevention preferences. We've also never managed to get the samples. Okay, well, do, do let me know if you do. I'd be fascinated to, to read it. Yeah. Well, I think that brings us to three o'clock. We thank you so much, Kuno. Um, this was fantastic. Um, is there anything?